Hello, welcome, welcome. We are in the middle of the right fright challenge, as you can see there. And today we're going to be talking about what scares us as authors and how we can use that in order uh, to write fright, as it were. <laughs> we can use some of the things that scare us and uh, we can flip it on their head and maybe even project it a little bit at the author, uh, at the audience. And of course, what scares us as authors is something that we need to face ourselves. So it's a little bit of double duty going on today. We like to uh, mix things up around here. And I did ask our audience how they are doing with the challenge. Um, but before I do that, let me go ahead and talk about the challenge itself, our right fight challenge and how it works. Now, what you're going to want to do is sign up because one thing you will be eligible for just for signing up are some prizes and yes you should subscribe to the channel but that wasn't what i was looking for this one yes the right fright challenge registration um it is a free challenge to join and as joining uh you will be eligible for some prizes and we will have some additional opportunities throughout the uh challenge to click on some check-in links i know some people have been really anxious about them because they've only seen one so far we have only sent one so far there will be more so just keep your eyes peeled. Um, and uh, you're also going to receive uh, tips and tricks uh, throughout the uh, challenge as well. Tips particularly on writing tension, how to write for fear. Now, this is not a typical horror challenge. This really is about writing fear and trying to build up suspense with an audience. Um, and so we do have some specific rules regarding your challenge. We don't want any ghosts. Yeah, no ghosts. We don't want any zombies. So no dead people coming back to life. Uh, and uh, no mythical animals. And we've had some questions about that. Like what is a mythical animal? If you're asking those sort of questions, it probably means you might rise a little bit more to meet the challenge, right? <laughs> Instead of working, looking for the workaround, uh, make sure, just do something that you know for a fact isn't going to be in that gray area because, you know, there are animals that people debate about. Generally speaking, I would say if you're debating it, consider it on the mythical level. All right, and then uh, no blood. No blood, yes. Now, this doesn't mean that uh, you can't have a situation that will end up in some sort of bloody, gory mess, but that's not what you're writing for this challenge. What you are writing is the maybe the build-up to it, and then the next word might even be what that gory uh, mess uh, would be. Uh, but uh, this is not something we need to see written specifically in uh, this uh, work that we are going to be judging. Now, the way the judging is going to work is a little bit differently than our past uh, contests. Ultimately, what we're looking for is a work under 1,000 words. So keep it lean and mean. This is another reason, too, why you don't have to necessarily spill the beans as to what happens. It can be a buildup. Uh, if somebody asks for that link in the comments, I'll go ahead and throw that right in there. So you can go ahead. Yep. Copy and paste a little easier. Um, let me go ahead and put that banner back up too. Yep. Um, and uh, yes, it needs to be under a thousand words. It keeps it lean and mean and simple. And uh, like I said, you can build up and not pay off. This is not something where we're going to expect necessarily a beginning, middle, and end. What we're looking for is that vibe. You know, are are we in the moment? Are you getting us riveted? Is it tense? Is it exciting? And ultimately, it's not going to be our decision anyway. It's going to be the live audience. Yes, it's going to be you. We're going to read the stories live on air, and then we will ask you which story you like the best. So there's going to be a vetting process to get to that point, and I don't even know how many we're going to end up at the end because it will base on length. We're going to have the timing, you know, of how much time we want to take uh, reading them. And so it depends on the length of the story. So I can't give you a definitive number as, and also quality. I can't give you a definitive number on how many they're going to be. So uh, just do your best. Uh, but uh, we will be uh, reading them live on air. So we'll take up a whole session and then we will let you decide uh, which story you thought was the best. So uh, it'll be up to you. Isn't that exciting? 
You declare that the mushroom beat story wins. Yes, that's a running gag uh, we've been doing for a while. What does it do? That is a great question. I believe that is my next slide. Let's see it. October 24th. Yes. Uh, October 24th is going to be when it's due. So don't do it. Um, so think of it as midnight on Sunday. Um, we try to be careful with how we close our forms based on different uh, time zones. So if you're 12, 12 a.m. on, well, I mean, it'd be 12 a.m. Monday, right? 11.59 on Sunday. Get that clear. Um, as long as you're thinking of that in your own time zone, you'll be fine. So just think of it like that. Is profanity okay? Um, yes, but I might censor it when I read it um, for the sake of YouTube because that does change our profile on YouTube. Not that we necessarily think of ourselves as material for children. Um, we don't, but even so, I believe it could flag it in YouTube in different ways, and so um, I would rather avoid that but I'm not to try to censor you as an artist, but just for the sake of this channel. You have a couple of ideas. Uh, can I submit more than one story? Um, we really ask that you only submit one. Now I say that technically speaking, if you picked a bunch of pseudonyms and you picked a bunch of emails, I wouldn't really be able to know. And I'm not telling you that so that you do that. I'm telling you that to try to just be honest and say, uh, we're trying to make sure everybody has an opportunity to be involved. Um, and we don't want to necessarily want to get barraged with a single person who's just very energetic. Um, so, uh, you know, try to keep that in mind. That's all. I respectfully ask that you only submit one. If you're writing about a mythical monster, not a mythical animal, is that okay? I mean, I would say no. I'm, I would try not to. Uh, you've subscribed, but you haven't been able to get on the page. Uh, there isn't a page connected to the challenge. Do you mean the submission form? Because you would have gotten an email about the submission form. If you didn't receive that email, check your spam filter. Uh, and, uh, if you didn't receive, if you didn't receive that email, don't worry, there'll be plenty of other emails along the way. Um, we're going to be sending out one, uh, I believe tomorrow that will also include the submission link. So they're going to be coming through, uh, throughout. Yeah. And the submission link is very simple. It's just a form that lets you copy and paste and put in your, um, your, uh, content. What's a non-mythical monster? A non-mythical monster would be an animal that you might de declare a monster even if they're not mythical, like Jaws. Because Jaws is kind of mythical in a way, but not exactly. It's just an exaggeration. What about Dibbuks? Is that the kind of the old, like, Polish possessed person? Is that what you're getting at? Uh, like the person, the ancestor comes back to life and takes on the form of somebody else um is that what you're talking about because that to me is kind of on the level of ghosts yeah jewish tradition yeah i've i that's what i thought yeah um that to me is on the, is kind of in the ghost category so i would steer away from it you need to clarify mythical animal monster creature I mean, I would say if it's something that is not speculated about from zoologists, it's not mythical. Uh, I wouldn't say most zoologists would say that vampires are are actually something that exists, right? Now, I understand you could say, well, they're not an animal; they're a humanoid type person. But even so, you know, a zoologist would tell you about humans being a species. <laughs> so I would say, I would say if it's something that is not in the level of fictional in terms of the species itself, it's not mythical. How about that? I love authors who are like folders, right? Well, I mean, you know, you can do whatever you want. I, 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 I'm on the panel and I will say I'm not going to be the harshest about making sure that you know, I'm going to try to be careful about these rules being followed. And I will say the first thing I'm going to look for are the people that followed the rules to a T. So they really did 
think outside of those tropes because that's what we're trying to challenge you to do, right? You know, while there's lots of stories about aliens and ghosts and, and this is all scary, you know, what's a scary story about like an elevator or a pencil sharpener or the DMV or whatever, right? Um, you know, there are different ways to talk about fear that aren't necessarily the typical horror tropes. Um, and so we are looking for uh, that uh, primarily. And that is going to be what we're going to push forward. So um, that's not to say, though, that other things might slip in, I suppose, depending on how they do it, uh, because, you know, we'll see how it goes. What level of fright are we expecting? Can it be mostly psychological? Something you think on and say, whoa. Yeah, it can be right? It doesn't have to be absolutely terrifying. It could be simply about um, tension, right? When the tracker becomes the tracked. Exactly. That's a good one. DMV is totally horror, especially on a Friday or a Monday. <laughs> yeah, it's not, not no, uh, no offense to it. Yeah, see, Bigfoot, I would say, is in that realm of mythical since it's cryptozoology, so... I'm looking back scientifically that yeah right you know we're trying to we're trying to stay and it's not because I have any issue with fantastical I do a whole fantasy class it's just for the purposes of this the reason why is because it's it's such a trope that horror will lean into paranormal or unexplained phenomenon to find fear and I don't even mean unexplained for the main character I just mean unexplained by an, by anybody and so we're trying to get you to think more about just writing fear in general and writing things that can make us tense in a normal situation <laughs> my hair looks more gray I think it's the lighting in this room I'm in a different room than normal, and so it's a, I'm a little more washed out. I'm not as colorful. So, no, I'm not I, – I, I wasn't scared by Ian that much. Um, I'm okay. <laughs> I love it. Where can you sign up for the fantasy class? I'm glad you asked. Yes, the fantasy class, our next uh, session is going to start uh, tomorrow, and I'll dump that in the chat just one moment here, and I'll put it on the screen if I can uh, – find it hold on here it is pardon me yes uh story sorcery and the and the quest to write stronger fantasy uh will begin uh tomorrow not tomorrow today's tuesday i forgot what day of the week it is uh thursday thursday night at 7 p.m uh, is going to be the first live session. And of course, you can always catch the live sessions after the fact. You don't actually have to be there. Although we do have a special incentive for the people who are there for the first uh, session. So try to if you can. Um, but uh, they will be recorded as well. All right, I'm going to take a few more questions and we'll get into... Uh, We'll get into uh, the uh, topic today, which is what scares us as artists. Although one thing that seems to scare us as artists are rules for challenges, I've noticed. Based on the pushback we always get when we get them. <laughs> we always get the loopholes. I love it, though. I, I, I tease, but but I, I, I love it. I'm going to use the lighting answer for my hair. Yes, that's a good one. See, I gave it to you. You can have it. Okay, so one thing that we're told often as artists is to write what we know. Okay, but this is bad. This is kind of bad advice in a sense, right? Because, like, what if you want to write fantasy? Or what if you want to write sci fi? Or what if you want to write about all kinds of things? And I think one of the reasons why a lot of us struggle with the dreaded imposter syndrome dun, 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 is because essentially we're writing what we don't know, right? It would be a lot easier for you to potentially write a memoir about yourself because you're an expert of yourself, right? Now, you may, may, who knows, you know, how interesting that might be one way or the other. Um, <laughs> hopefully your life, I guess, I don't know. Is it a good thing if your life is interesting or is it not? Anyway, um, but uh, the one thing is, is when you're writing fiction, you're often having to write things that aren't really what you quote unquote know, right? You're having to empathize with people from a different perspective. You're having to write about per uh, situations that may in fact not even exist or couldn't even possibly exist. And we can often feel like, 
well, how are we even going to pull this off? Is it even believable? Does it even make sense that we're doing this? Like, what are we even doing trying to write a book? Um, and it's true. And this is something that we all have to push past as authors. Uh, even really successful authors, though, deal with this, uh, particularly when you find yourself in the company of established artists, right? Because uh, a lot of people be like, oh, I don't know. Should I even be talking to you? Because I'm just at this level and you're at this level. And to be honest, that's often what imposter syndrome is uh, talking about. It's that kind of need for us uh, to level up. Now, sometimes that's fake, right? We're just fooling ourselves. And we're actually, we actually have leveled up and we don't want to admit it. Or it's hard for us to find see that perspective. But sometimes it's literally, it's it's kind of getting at something. It's getting at hmm, maybe we should do a little bit more research or uh, maybe we should look into things uh, in a little bit of a deeper way in order to make sure it works. Now, you could say again, how do you research a lot of what I do? I mean, I write fantastical things or I write sci-fi or whatever it is. Well, you can still research. You can still research um, similar things, you know, analogs of what you're talking about. Are you writing about a low-technology society that is magic? Well, Look up low technology uh, societies. Talk to historians that know about low technology societies. Are you doing a dystopia? Look into how actual like authoritative governments uh, have operated. You know, read memoirs of people who have grown up in those sort of situations. You know, even if it's not an exact duplicate of what you're doing, uh, it can give you a lot more confidence that what you're doing is uh, correct. Now. Let's flip it on the audience <laughs> because everybody experiences this, right? Everybody experiences the idea that you are not where you should be. Like you don't have that. Well, maybe you're among people that you feel very humbled by, or you don't feel like you are really cut out for what you're being asked to do, right? Your responsibility in your workplace is maybe beyond your comprehension, you know, beyond what you're comfortable with. So this is something that you can uh, you can get at when you're trying to talk about fear is that anxiety of being overwhelmed by a situation and feeling inferior. And one way you can make sure you do this is by not overpowering your main character. Uh, we talk about this a lot where, you know, people will constantly talk about all the great things that their character can do and they forget to think about, well, what can the character not do? What are they bad at? Because not only do you need to know what they're bad at, you need to make them do it, right? If they are not very good at dancing, well, they better have to dance sometime in the book. And I don't care. I mean, I do care how contrived you make it. But no, figure out a way to make it happen or something similar. They have to have rhythm at a scene or something like that. Uh, this is how you can really get the audience on your side because we've all been there and we can all relate to imposter syndrome. All right. Rejection. <laughs> this is something we all fear as authors is being rejected on multiple levels, right? Uh, rejected by the quote unquote industry or the professionals. Perhaps we're trying to attract an agent or attract a publisher. So of course you have to send things out, get rejected. But I think even beyond that. That's bad enough. But I think even beyond that, what we're scared about is kind of is basically being rejected by audiences, right? Is putting our stuff out there and the audience is like, nah, I have no interest. And that's a scary thing. Well, keep that in mind when you're writing, especially when you're writing scenes about tension. A lot of times what people are reacting to and what can keep them scared and kind of closed in is the fear of the reaction of what will happen if they act upon what they want to do. So they might think they're good enough to do something, and they very well might be good enough to do something, but are they actually going to do it? Well, depends. And uh, you can cripple somebody by having them just be bound by that fear of rejection, and a lot of audi you know, the audience is going to understand because we've all been there. We've all been in a situation where fear of rejection has kept us from doing something, sometimes something very important, uh, because we're just uh, fearful of how it's going to be perceived by others. Uh, let's see what we got here. We're, my characters tend to have a pressing fear of helplessness. Interesting. <laughs> 
you have no idea why. <laughs> That's where, again, you can write what you know, right? Uh, it can be difficult, and I'm not telling you to treat writing as therapy or become like method actors too much because that can really do a number on your on your, on your your health, especially your mental health. Uh, but do think about some of the things that trouble you. Do think about some of the things that give you anxiety. And, uh, you know, it can provide an outlet to talk about it and express that. And uh, I, it, there is a little bit of not like legit therapy about it necessarily. I'm certainly not going to, um, I'm not a trained psychologist, so don't take it like that. But, you know, you certainly can uh, you know, get feel rewarded out of it and fulfilled. And I definitely know people who have read things and uh, through that main character's growth, it's helped them uh, overcome some things in their own personal life. You have so many characters in mind, it's putting them to a storyline that you struggle with. Interesting. So uh, that's a common thing where people like to brainstorm characters and then you don't know what to do with them. Well, let's go back to what I was just talking about, right? The why can't this person? So figure out what your characters are bad at and then make them do it. I mean, that's kind of the kind of the simple high level answer, right? So what makes them interesting is that they're really good at something. And maybe you haven't even thought of what they're bad at. That's fine. So they're really interesting because they're really good at something. People that are really good at something, that can tell you what they might not be good at because there's often a little bit of a counterpoint to that, right? You know, you're really good at analyzing, but maybe you're really bad at relaxing because you always want to micromanage everything, you know? And so what you do is you put them in a situation where they're forced to do what they're bad at and you immediately have tension. And there's a starting point for your story for you. All right. Uh, let's see. Not finding your place. Yes. This is kind of goes along with what I'm saying with rejection and imposter syndrome, right? A lot of us have this fear that we are not going to find our footing. It's not that we don't think we're good enough. And it's not that we don't, it's not that we think that everyone is going to reject us. We're just worried we're ever going to find the people that won't reject us. You know, that we're going to have a conversation with as artists, that people are going to really love us. You know what I mean? I don't think a lot of people, a lot of people necessarily set out and be like, oh, I'm going to be, you know, the next billion dollar, you know, private island author, right? I think a lot of us are comfortable with the idea that we might have a niche following that just really love our work. But a lot of us are concerned, well, how are you going to find that, right? How are you going to find those dedicated fans? And uh, I would say audience members feel the same way about a lot of things in life. Uh, one reason why we love to read about capable main characters is because we often feel we have not reached our full potential in our capabilities. So when you read about somebody and they practiced a skill really well and they're like an expert at it and it's obvious to other people and they're acknowledged for it, that's really captivating because that's the kind of life that we tend to want. We want to feel like, you know, we have figured out what we're particularly good at and uh, we're recognized for it and we're living our best self. But of course there's a fear that perhaps we'll never figure that out. And, you know, I'm not, and I'll, and uh, it's understandable because I know some people who do feel pretty lost and they haven't really figured it out. And so uh, it's very troubling to them. Again, though, this is something you can bring up in your works. You can have characters uh, that feel very much the same way. Uh, this can be helpful too uh, if they're, if they're capable, they know they're capable, but they're not being recognized it by the world in your story. Just because they're really good at something doesn't mean in the story uh, that they have to start out where the world recognizes their talent. Uh, it could be that the world is completely oblivious to their talent. And therefore, people, and therefore, uh, their story is to figure out how to get recognized by other people in the world. And uh, that can be a very compelling place. Not every story is for every reader. People need their stories told. Representation matters, especially disabled people. Uh, we are going to get to that, John. So hold that thought. <laughs> but yes, uh, putting your own fear out there is risky because people who don't experience something the same exact way might lash out. Be prepared. That's true. But remember, when you're writing about a character, uh, ultimately who they're going to have a beef with is yourself. Well, is is uh, with how you're portraying the character, right? 
So they're not necessarily going to have a beef with you as, well, you're saying everybody in that situation would react that way. Not necessarily. What you're saying is that character would, right? I've written characters that react very differently in terms of how they process fear than me. I, I believe it's a realistic way of doing it uh, because it represents how I feel other people react, which is not the same as me. Uh, but uh, I think we all realize that every time a character reacts in a certain way, uh, they are not representative of all people in all situations right uh but what you do need to do is you do need to uh keep consistent right so if you have a character that tends to react in a certain way in fearful situations and then at some point they're going to react differently you need to call that out you need to explain well what what changed because otherwise it's just not going to seem consistent it'll seem really convenient and if all of a sudden they can muscle up a whole bunch of courage out of nowhere just because you painted yourself into a corner right you need to figure out a way to convey that are we saving this live stream we always save the live stream as best we can so check it out right after it's over uh if you're catching it in the middle you got pushback at the age of one of your characters because she's doing something they didn't like I tried to explain that's how she felt, not my personal view of the situation in real life. It is funny. I mean, I'm not, as much as I say people should understand that, yes, of course, there will be authors that will get feedback. I mean, what if you want to portray somebody who has a really bad attitude or a preju prejudiced attitude? Because, of course, there are people like that in life. That doesn't mean that's what you think, right? And it can be hard as an author because it's like, I'm not as horrible as that person. They're just my main character. And yeah, they're. They're they're the like they're the scum of the earth, but that's not me. I'm just writing about the scum of the earth, um, and uh, yeah, you do have to be careful about that sometimes, for sure. Does anybody else slam out a story, love it, then reread it later and loathe it? Yes, that can happen. That's one reason why we recommend you to take a break. You write your first draft, you put it to the side, and then you come back, and it's almost like a new book that you haven't read. However, uh, sometimes you might be a bit harsh, so be careful. <laughs> but yes, never being acknowledged is a huge fear. Like we're just never going to find that. We're never going to find our, our, our group. We're never going to find the place where we belong, we're accepted, all of that sort of stuff. That's a huge fear. And that's something that you can use to your advantage in different situations. This is how you can make uh you know the first day at school a terrifying scene, right? Because somebody can feel so much anxiety about what's going to happen and the ripple effects and every little choice is going to affect the whole year. And some of this might be over-dramatized when you're, you know, in the high school age or something like that, but it's somewhat true. Yes, you do make first impressions and yes, there are impacts and yes, it can be hard to find a group and yeah, you can end up, you know, and all of these things can be true. And so that's what makes it scary is there, it comes from a place of, 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 a, of a real possibility. That's rather terrifying. Uh, <laughs> yes, you left the stream. Yes, it's being recorded. <laughs> I love it. Fear of public speaking. Uh, we're going to get to that a little bit more in a minute, but that kind of comes in the same sort of putting yourself out there, right? And how is it going to be accepted by others? All right. What about qualifications? Feeling underqualified. That is uh, back to that imposter syndrome, right? It's that you don't feel like you should uh, talk about what you're talking about. Now, as authors, uh, this is a this is a big issue with a lot of people, right? In terms of what 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 am I allowed to talk about? And I don't have any easy answers for you, but I will uh, go to what Stephen King said in On Writing, which is generally something I take to heart when he says, "What can you write?" And he says, "Anything you want, as long as it's the truth." And, and I think that's fair. Um, I think generally where people get themselves into a lot of hot wa water with what they're talking about, it's when they're speaking from a place that doesn't feel genuine. It feels like they have a, a, an ax to grind and they're not really trying to speak to truth. Uh, they're speaking to some sort of agenda. Now, that being said, that's not going to get you completely out of the woods in every situation. But, I, but, you know, this is something that can sometimes keep us from writing. And sometimes that's not for the best. Uh, sometimes just because you are not sure that you're qualified uh, to talk about something, it doesn't mean you aren't. 
you know, people can have empathy for all different kinds of situations. Uh, people can research, people can ask questions, people can have conversations, people can use, uh, you know, if you're representing a person that is very different from yourself and who knows what category, reach out and talk to people that are from that category or have them read the book and make sure that it does come across like it's from a true place and things like that. Um, but I would be careful about letting it limit you, yourself too much. I don't know if this is a fear that we should allow to rule over us, you know, uh, within reason, of course. Okay. Experience. What about the fact that you maybe just haven't written much at all? And that's fine. Maybe this is your first book. Maybe you've never even written in a challenge before or anything, you know, maybe you wrote back in high school or whatever, and you're just getting into it. Great. Fantastic. You know, sign up, be a part of this. You're going to start somewhere. I'm not saying that I expect you to win the first time out, who knows, but you know, this is all part of the process. And again, part of experience is having a experience. It's kind of like that chicken, the egg scenario, right? It's like jobs. We get frustrated because it's like, you need 15 years whatever experience. And it's like, well, if everybody wants me to have 15 years experience, how do I ever get the experience? And to some extent, that's kind of true. And what you'll find is often those jobs uh, will compromise uh, uh, if you uh, if you apply for them. You know, I've gotten jobs that I was underqualified for in terms of my experience on paper, but I demonstrated in other ways that I could do it. And it's the same thing with writing. You may not have a bunch of best-selling books behind your name, but that doesn't mean that you're any less capable of writing something fantastic uh, as somebody who does necessarily, right? It's all based on uh, your ability. And the only way for you to get experience is by getting experience. So you will just have to put yourself out there and uh, yeah, and the fact that you don't have experience is not a reason to put yourself out there. Just go ahead and do it because that's how you get experience. It seems kind of obvious, but it is one of those, uh, yes, it's like a catch-22. How do you get experience when you can't, how can you get experience if you can't get experience? Ultimately, we, the nice thing about the modern uh, writing world is that there's so many ways to get experience without any sort of gatekeepers whatsoever. You know, you can put yourself out there on all kinds of platforms. You can self-publish. You can just get on Wattpad or something, right? You know, you can use the Autocrit community and share it. Like, there's so many different the, – the, the challenges. There's so many different ways that you can give yourself experience that doesn't require talking to anybody else, which is kind of a wonderful thing. Kind of a scary thing, but don't throttle yourself, you know? Let yourself go out there. Look at that. See, always try. You may get lucky. My first time out submitting to an anthology, I got it. It's true. Uh, the first time that I pitched to an agent, I got a manuscript request. And I know that makes me like a hated person. It didn't work out. Okay. So you can, you don't have to put pins in my voodoo doll uh, because of that. But, but um, no, it, uh, it, but it was like one of those things, right? And I was scared. I was like, I don't know. Is this idea any good? Are they just going to think it's garbage? Actually, when they asked for it, I was like, seriously? You actually want to read it? And I was like, oh, I probably just ruined myself because I didn't sound very confident. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's how I felt. A manuscript. <laughs> I've always wanted to literally walk a plank. Yeah, you know. One thing I've heard is, uh, speaking of such, is uh, the fear of embarrassment, you know, with putting yourself out there. Uh, one thing to help you get over that is to deliberately embarrass yourself. And what I mean by that is, what are things that you find embarrassing? Uh, like, do them. You know, if it's like, oh, when people get up and they sing karaoke, even though they're not very good at singing, well, then do it. Go up, if you're not a very good singer, you know, go up there and, and sing some karaoke, even though you're not very good at doing it. And you know what you'll find? The world doesn't come to an end. You know, and uh, often you, you and and it could be troublesome. Uh, don't get me wrong. Uh, you know, and it's something you might have to process. But you, it's a bit like exposure therapy in of a sense. Again, though, I'm not a psychologist. Okay, just want to get that out there. <laughs> I'm just a friend offering some advice. Um, it's not good enough. Yes, this is our fear. Um, and of course, um, <laughs> um, it's not good enough. Is something that can really keep us back because ultimately the answer is in a sense yes it isn't good enough i mean 
because nothing is now i mean we may have our works that we just love and we're like i can't even think of anything wrong with this but the truth of the matter is is if you really thought hard you could probably figure out one little thing to adjust that might make it slightly better right so no like if your if your answer is like well i don't know if it's good enough well it's probably never good enough in a certain sense right the question is is if it's good enough to put out there and my answer is generally uh, have you seen what's out there? Yeah, it probably is. <laughs> that sounds a little cynical, but no, it's true. Like, you know, we've seen plenty of uh, books and movies and, and things, and we're like, wow, the writing in this is terrible. And it's getting like billion dollar budgets and things like that. And obviously somebody else didn't think it was terrible or it wouldn't be it wouldn't be out there. So put yourself out there. Give it a whirl. See what happens. Uh, let other people tell you if it's good enough. You know, don't just throttle yourself. But getting back to writing for the audience, this is an this is a this is a feeling that a lot of people have all the time. You know, I'm never going to measure up to X standard, the standard my parents gave me, the standard my teacher gave me, um, uh, the love of my spouse, whatever it is, the good enough parent, you know, good enough worker. You know, people have a lot of anxiety about be measuring up to expectation and again when you're thinking of a tense scene this is something to keep in the back of your head you know what are some of those things that cripple us that keep us from 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 being our best selves from making sometimes really bad choices because we get impulsive you know and this idea of not being good enough it's one of them keep it in the back of your head all right moving on ad reactions yes this kind of goes to the not being good enough. You know, that's more of an internal thing. This is, well, I think I'm good enough, but I don't know how people are going to react to what I'm saying. And that kind of gets to my next point, which is scared of the truth. Specifically scared of the truth as you see it, right? Because we're all going to come to the truth with a different perspective, uh, a different way of analyzing the information in front of us. And uh, sure, there are some universal truths that most of us can agree upon, but there's a lot of different perspectives that seem very true to us that do not seem true to anybody else. And we're aware of this. And the last thing we want to do is put ourselves out there and then people are going to be like, ugh, that perspective, yikes. You know, that's it's very personal, right? And we can put a lot of ourselves in uh, these uh, books. Well, again, this is something that your characters face all the time. Uh, characters are all are just, you know, are, especially well-rounded ones, right? Should be concerned about whether or not just the perception of reality uh, is going to be met well. <laughs> you know, are other people seeing what they're seeing? You know, we've had the whole like blue dress, white dress thing and the, the Yorl and y Yammy or however that was, you know, Laurel and Yammy, right? Um, and all those things and uh, all these fun games. And of course, you can get into different things like politics and social politics and all this, you know, and, and a lot of us could be looking at the same thing and coming to different perspectives. And so it is scary when you put yourself out there. Um, and it's uh, scary as an artist when you start to kind of, you know, talk about things, especially when it comes to fear. Because <laughs> uh, somebody even pointed it out earlier. They were like, hey, I, I don't like the fact that that character did that. And they're like, well, well, I didn't like it either. That's just what the character did, right? But in that character's mind, that was the right thing to do, right? And so to be honest to the character, getting back to what Stephen King says about telling the truth, that is how a person like that would behave. And as, as, as uncomfortable as it might make us, that's what they do, you know. Uh, sometimes that's what it's about. And sometimes that's scarier than almost anything. I can think of one of the scary, like, one of the scariest scenes. I'm not generally somebody who who goes <laughs> into horror all that much, to be honest. Um, Gareth can tell you in the horror class I almost passed out the first time I heard it because I'm kind of squeamish. But one of the scariest scenes I've ever seen in film was in Steven Spielberg's War of the Worlds, and it was the way that the mob was portrayed when they figured out that the main character's car was the only functioning car. And the reason why it really scared me is because, okay, the tripods are freaky because, yeah, aliens and all that. But that's like real life. That's like a truth. You know, I've been in situations where if something were to have gone wrong, it could have gotten really dangerous in a hurry. And it's something that I tend to have anxiety about when I'm in a very 
kind of claustrophobic crowd situation. I'm not generally afraid of crowds, but in situations like that, like I'm the person that'll be like, the egresses are there, 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 there. If I need, to, if it starts to stampede, like, I don't know why I've never had like some sort of traumatic event in my background that I'm aware of that I'm this hyper aware. Um, maybe I just, cause I've read about a lot of those situations. I mean, thankfully. Um, but um, yeah, like, that is something that when Steven Spielberg pointed out, it just made me so uncomfortable because it was the truth I really didn't want to face that, yeah, people will behave in horrific, brutal ways. And it's really terrifying. Uh, but I'm grateful as an artist that he went there, you know, that he didn't, even though uh, there's other moments where people act heroically. And, it, and it's nice because he's, it's, he's not just a huge old, big old cynic. Um, but there is something to be said about that. And, uh, you know, it's like Lord of the Flies, right? Woo, scary stuff. Okay. Fear of success. You're like, wait a minute. I don't have a fear of success. Bring it on. Money, money, money. Now, um, <laughs> the thing about artists is that sometimes we can be responsible for sabotaging ourselves. Um, and that's because we're afraid of the consequences of success. Most of us are not really afraid. It's like, oh, what if money just dropped from the sky? That's not really a big fear. Uh, what uh, we're scared about is what that will mean, right? What is our responsibility? Um, so success as an artist is kind of particularly frightening in some ways, right? Because as soon as you got it, like imagine, you know, what you're working on right now, you put it out there, it's a bestseller. Okay, now what, right? It's kind of scary. It's like, well, what do I know? Can I do it again? Can I follow it up? I mean, I don't even know exactly what I'm doing right now. I mean, I kind of do, but I kind of don't. It's kind of like I'm flying by the seat of my pants and I don't know. You know, like it can it can avalanche really fast. Uh, <laughs> and so um, it can be something that can stop people. Now, you could have an attitude like this. If you succeed, then be doing them an excuse to try more. In which case, it's like, yeah, I'll take the money and run. But I will say most artists don't tend to have that perspective, right? Because what we crave is that conversation. We crave impacting other people's lives and people being excited by what we do. And so in a sense, as much as we really want that awesome smash hit, what we don't want is that one hit wonder exactly, right? Because then it's like, well, I don't know. Is it just luck or was it really actually good or whatever, you know? And uh, it can sometimes cripple you. You can pull you back because you don't necessarily want to know what will happen if it's successful. And you'd be surprised how much self-sabotaging can happen. It's one of those things you don't even realize it often until somebody points it out to you. Um, and that's because, like I said, it's not like so many people are going to be like, oh, I don't want this book to sell. But sometimes there's something kind of in the back of your mind that's like, well, I don't really want it to do too well exactly, so I don't know. And so maybe what you do is you don't do as many blog appearances or you don't make sure the book cover is good or you don't overwrite the blurb or things like that because you're worried that you're going to kind of make this fake success and you don't really want that. And, you know, you can, you can mess yourself up. And uh, the same thing can happen with characters in the books. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, this is true. Sherlock Holmes, yeah, he killed them off because he didn't want to write them anymore. Uh, Walt Disney said that there was a time that he hated Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs because he made Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and everybody was like, we want more Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And he put out Pinocchio, beautiful movie, didn't do well. It bombed. He put out Fantasia, really artistic, experimental movie. It bombed, <laughs> you know. Uh, he put out Bambi. It bombed. <laughs> he put out Dumbo. It did okay. And he didn't have as much involvement in that one. So it was like everything he was really involved with was bombing except for Snow White. And yeah, he had a big resentment for it for a while. Which, by the way, obviously Pinocchio and Fantasia and Bambi are considered classics now. I'm talking about back in the 1940s. Ultimately, Cinderella in the 1950s was made because Walt Disney was like, I don't know, I guess I'll do Snow White again. <laughs> and you will you can see it's very similar in the way that he did the formula with uh, Cinderella and Snow White. Certainly a lot closer than the more experimental uh, Pinocchio, Bambi, and uh, Fantasia. So... Oh, writing excuses. That's a great podcast. Uh, they pointed out that your greatest idea probably still isn't your best idea. It may be the best idea you've had so far, but not ever. Write it and move on. It's true. 
It's true. All right. Overwhelming. Yes, we can find success to be overwhelming as well because now we have an audience expectation uh, that they want something from us, right? And we almost owe them something because they've come along with us ride. They've given us whatever success, whatever accolades, whatever, you know, fandom <laughs> that they're going to do. And then at that point, it's like, uh-oh, now we're beholden to them to return something to them, which is kind of what we all want. Well, actually, it is what we all want as artists, but sometimes the idea of it can be overwhelming. It's a bit like, to use kind of an interesting metaphor, it's a bit like people uh, with children, right? Before they have children, they will want them, but then they'll often have anxiety about it because it's like, okay, well, we know once we have them, they're going to be very dependent on us. But on the other hand, that's such a beautiful relationship. I, I want to have it anyway. Yeah, it's kind of the same thing, right? And uh, you will have to... Uh, move yourself forward you'll have to understand you know uh, uh deal with it as best you can in terms of the audience well keep in mind uh your characters will feel like this about many things in their life uh, it could be their biggest goal we usually tell you that you need a trackable goal for them in the story the main character it could be that on the one hand they really want it but on the other hand the consequences of getting it kind of frighten them and so uh, they could be responsible for some of the uh, for some of the obstacles along the way. Uh, of course, the other thing is give it to them and make it horrible. That could be a scary thing, right? Um, what you've always wanted in life is the worst thing for you, kind of the King Midas sort of tragedy, right? And uh, this can be a very compelling, scary story to tell because we can all relate to that. Work over 20 years on a novel. People will not want to wait another 20 years for a sequel. It's true. Right? It's very true. Well, I mean, you can get to the point. I mean, look at like George R. R. Martin, right? Imagine the pressure uh, that he must be experiencing because he's created this big empire and this epic story. And it's so complicated and dense. And yeah, people are just waiting. You know, doo -doo -doo. So imagine what you must feel like when you sit at the keyboard. I wouldn't envy that job. I wouldn't. I don't think... Honestly, I mean, as much as I appreciate uh, being acknowledged for what I'm good at, I don't know if I would ever want to get to that level. So I can certainly understand potentially sabotaging myself as a, uh, instead of wanting to get to that level, because that, that's, that's terrifying to me. All right, selling yourself. Yes, this is an issue that a lot of people are scared of. Um, and I don't mean like selling yourself out, although that can scare people. They can be scared. Am I going to lose myself in this process? Am I going to pursue the audience so much that I'm going to fail to be who I am anymore? Am I going to become like a parody of myself or something? Uh, that That's potentially true. But another thing that can be very, we can be very scared of is having to put ourselves out there in terms of marketing ourselves, right? Because it's like, well, we shouldn't have to. If we were that good, wouldn't it just happen organically? Yeah, no, that's not how it works. <laughs> how many things have you found out about organically? You have, you know, friends have told you or things like that. But a lot more things you were alerted uh, at by something, right? And getting that momentum started, the odds of it being completely a grassroots effort is also not very likely. It does happen from time to time. Um, so I can understand why you might be wish that this was you, uh, because you, you know, you want to be the person who didn't have to knock on doors and hug babies or whatever it is you're going to have to do to get people to what you're doing. Um, unfortunately that's not how it works for most people, right? You know, even, I mean, we see it, we're in political season right now, <laughs> scary enough as it is, uh, but you know, people who have quite a reputation uh, still have to knock on the door, they have to do the speeches, they have to sell themselves, they have to put out ads, they have to do all this stuff, uh, because they have to stay on the, at the forefront of people's mind. Um, and you know, that's just how it is, but it can, we can be a little bit resentful of that, not just because of the extra effort, but it can kind of feed into that imposter syndrome because we can feel like, well, why do we have to, why do I have to push myself that hard? If I was that good, wouldn't it just happen? And the answer is no, not, not necessarily. No, that's not how it works. Uh, you know, so many people are clamoring for people's attention. The audience's attention is getting divided a million different ways. Yeah, you're going to have to spend, spend some effort to stand out. doesn't matter how good your work is. 
you know, it's just what it is. It comes with the territory. And again, this is something that can happen in your own work. So in your main character's uh, story, what you'll often have is an apprehensive main character. They don't really want to do anything. Uh, and one of the reasons why sometimes is that, well, they don't want to have to put themselves out there. They wish that things could just kind of naturally flow. And nope, that's not how life works. And so when you see characters having to, to deal with that and cope with that, uh, it's very relatable. Uh, because, I mean, this is really any career, right? You know, most people don't get promotions unless they make sure that they are they put in the, the time and, and you know, uh, do all the paperwork and have the one-on-one -on -one meetings and, and and talk themselves up and whatever it is they have to do and it's really annoying and you have to you have to do all that sort of stuff but the thing is is otherwise you just get you often just get lost right or if you're an independent contractor you know you have to sell yourself even if you're great at your trade and on all of this stuff like it doesn't matter if you're a writer or not um but it could be something that really frustrates us in life and it can be something we're scared of doing we're scared of actually putting ourselves out there, talking about ourselves, because it's so awkward. <laughs> it's really awkward to be like, oh, yeah, I'm actually really good at this. It's like, whoa, uh, I sound like a jerk. Um, but you know, often that's what you have to do. Because <laughs> otherwise, if you're not going to say it, nobody is. But uh, feeling arrogant, yes. But, you know, at a certain point, you shouldn't. If you've given your book to a few, quite a few people and they said it was great and they loved it, well, you're, you can fairly say, hey, I've written a book lots of people love. You should read it. You'll probably like it. It doesn't make you some sort of arrogant jerk. So don't be like that. You can also just feel like you're harassing for attention, right? Ugh, the worst. All right. So those are some tips about being scared as an author and uh, ultimately trying to make your audience scared. A bit like uh, this lovely lady behind me. <laughs> who's obviously reading something that's making her quite tense. Maybe because she was involved in, whoa, I have a blob, the Narrative Tension Workshop. Yes. So the Narrative Tension Workshop uh, is going to be starting in just a couple of weeks. It will be running on Thursday the 20th and Sunday the 23rd in terms of our live sessions. But like all of our workshops and classes, you can, of course, uh, watch replays and be involved not live and in person because we know we have different time zones and all that uh the way it works is we will be going through different word choices and paragraph techniques and sentence structure and all kinds of nitty gritty stuff <laughs> we're gonna get really under the hood on this one this is gonna be a very nerdy discussion but you're gonna come out a much better writer uh and uh we'll be talking specifically though about tension you know how do you write these sort of scenes that really keep that the audience on the edge of the seats we're gonna analyze uh, some famous examples it's gonna be good times i'm very excited about it and at the end of it, you can submit a thousand words and that will be uh, analyzed by the instructors and our writing staff here. Um, and you'll get some personalized feedback uh, for that. So it's a great opportunity to level up in your tension writing. <laughs> Watch out the fly big flaws after you. <laughs> she's reading about marketing. I love how you just give writers a prompt and they just start making up. She's citing for a dynamics exam. <sighs> Worrying about the comma usage. That kind of comes with the imposter, right? You're going to make a silly mistake and embarrass yourself. Yeah, no, don't worry about it. I mean, we pointed it out a few episodes ago in the What's the Score. Stephen King made an, uh, an error in his point of view. And that's not just Stephen King, right? Stephen King had to make the error. It had to go to an editor. It probably went to a proofreader. You know, it, it hit a lot of channels uh, before it got to publish, and it still had a mistake in it. So, you know, give yourself a little leeway there. All right, don't forget, Nightmare Fuel currently uh, going on. It is a great uh, class. Uh, Sign-ups are available for the next session. Oh, you missed all the some of this because you can't Well, you can go ahead and watch the replay. Don't worry about that. But yes, sign up today for Nightmare Fuel right here. Autocrit.com slash nightmare dash fuel dash course. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can join uh, Gareth 
in his recorded sessions where he tells you all the nitty gritty about writing horror. Uh, we'll we have some special live guests. Just it's a really an all inclusive horror one stop shop tour de force. I'm just going to use a bunch of cliches there, but it's it's really great. <laughs> And Story Sorcery, beginning tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. Uh, not tomorrow evening. I keep saying that. It's Tuesday. Thursday evening at 7 p.m. Uh, Story Sorcery is hosted by yours truly, and I go through uh, how to write a fantasy novel. It's particularly helpful uh, if you're on the newer side, but if you're not, you'll learn some different ways of looking at things. You know, I'm Daniel. I've got a different perspective. Um, and uh, it'll help you go back to the well, get some ideas, uh, and uh, conjure up some new fun and excitement in the fantasy uh, genre. Are there any right fright winning submissions in the past available? No, because this is in fact our inaugural right fright. We have never done this before. So we've done other challenges before. And if you want to see the winners for those, uh, you can go back to uh, the archives. Like, for example, we just did uh, the Drop the Beat one last week. Uh, the Change the World was about four weeks before that. Um, and then we also had... Um, the writing challenge, which we didn't read the, the whole uh, short stories out loud, but we talked about them, and you can go back to that as well. I could go super medieval and use no punctuation. Yes, no, please, please don't do that. I have heard of people doing that, and no, that's not a nice thing to do. I don't recommend that. <laughs> I certainly hope not, but I do try. I do try to make myself known about you. <laughs> yes, history in the making. Yes, this is our. You will be whoever wins this will be the first winner of Right Fright. It's quite. It's quite something. Uh, we also have done a um, what was it? A tale in a day. If you look up those, those are fun. Tale in a day. Um, we did that at the beginning of the year. And people had one day to write a short story. Uh, and we got some pretty cool submissions on that. Uh, and you can see some of the ones submitted for that. Trying to read those manuscripts is heavy confusing. Uh, if it doesn't have any punctuation, then yes. I will say, if you ever submit anything to me and it has zero punctuation, you can expect that I will comment and I will probably um, tell you that uh, I am not a fan. I'll just put it that way. Because <laughs> ouch. Ouch. It's hard enough when people don't break up their paragraphs well and so you get those blocks of text. Sometimes I just do it for them just because I can't handle it. I need some light space. <laughs> honorable mention. Yes, you've gotten some honorable mentions there. That's great. All right. So... I will see you here next Tuesday. Next Tuesday, we're going to be talking about writing fear itself. So we are a little more abstract today, talking about what scares us and how we can channel that energy towards writing about fear. Next week, we're going to be kind of breaking down uh, what fear is and how to write it well. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. And um, we might even have a little bit of samples from some of the uh, well, submissions. I have gotten a fair amount of submissions already. I'm really impressed. Uh, people are very anxious to be involved. I think this is going to be a uh, high turnout. So uh, bring your best because I think it's going to be pretty competitive, which, which I love to see. Of course, it means I have a lot to read. So... I better get to that. So that being said, uh, we'll see you around the Auto Creek community. We have some amazing things lined up. Please like, subscribe, hit the bell, tell your friends. There's some fantastic things coming uh, to the community very soon. Um, and I would love to be able to talk to you about it, but it's a big secret. But your the Auto Creek Pro members are going to find out about it soon. <laughs> I'll say that. So be checking your emails because if you're going to get some fun and excitement in your emails and some big doings, big doings around here. Uh, anyway, we'll see you around uh, Autocrit. Bye, everybody.